Ladies and gentlemen, the floor to our rector, Professor Gianmario Verona. Signor Presidente del Consiglio, Signor Prefetto, Autorità Civile, Professori, Studentesse e Studenti, Dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, with us this evening for the conclusion of the conference we organized in memory of Professor Alberto Alesina. Let me extend a special thank you to President Mario Draghi for taking part to this tribute event and specifically to the panel economic policy in an age of uncertainty with also professors Larry Summers and Silvana Tenreio. The panel will be moderated later by Lionel Barber after these introductory remarks. As you all might imagine, we were all struck by the sudden death of Alberto on May 2020, and since then we have been wondering how to commemorate his legacy. In the spirit of his teaching, we have decided to organize a two-day conference ending with this special tribute event. Let me for this wholeheartedly thank, on behalf of all Bocconi community, Susan Alesina, who generously supported us in organizing this event. Thank you very much, Susan. And let me also thank Professor Francesco Giavazzi that ideated the event, and Professors Eliana LaFerrara and Guido Tabellini that took charge of the scientific conference. The bond between Alberto and Bocconi has been extremely strong, despite he spent most of his life in the United States after his PhD at Harvard. Not only graduated at Bocconi back in 1981, but he has been for several years visiting professor at Bocconi University, and so he was mentor for many of our Master of Science students and PhD students. There are plenty of things that each of us can take from Alberto's legacy. Let me simply remark in these brief introductory remarks two of them, which I believe are extremely crucial in these times of uncertainty. The first one is the importance of interdisciplinary knowledge. Professor Alesina has been a pioneer of modern political economy. Modern political economy is a robust empirical field that gets intuition not only from the field of economics, but also from fields like sociology, psychology, and politics, to name a few. In these days of high complexity, this interdisciplinary knowledge is the name of the game for scientific research and also for policy decisions. So thank you very much, Alberto, wherever you are for this. The second one is the importance of human capital and of younger generations. Alberto has been an outstanding mentor, and this today's conference has been a demonstration. We have met many of his disciples that praised his... And I believe, again, that the human capital and next generations are really crucial, like we know very well from Next Generation EU Fund and PNRR in Italy. So thank you, Alberto, also for this. I look forward to hearing from the distinguished panel, and I leave the floor for the rest of the introductory remarks to President of the Bocconi University, Mario Monti. Thank you very much. Mr. Prime Minister, dear Mario, dear Susan Alesina, dear members of the panel, in addition to Professor Draghi himself, thank you all for being here. We are particularly grateful to uh, you, Mr. Prime Minister, who have accepted uh, uh, to be here at this university once again, as you did uh, precisely to honor Alberto Alesina 10 years ago, when you were president of the ECB, and I was not really belonging to this university at that very moment because I was busy elsewhere you know, in a place you know. <laughs> Uh, you were the guest of honor to the inauguration of the academic year, and you also presided over the uh, dedication 
of the Tommaso Padua Schioppa chair set up by the uh, ECB to the first uh, incumbent, Alberto. Um, I met for the first time Alberto in 1976 as an entering student to this university. I must say he was from Broni, near Pavia. Another graduate from this university, from Broni, many years earlier, was Paolo Baffi, the very distinguished director general and then governor of the Bank of Italy. And uh, two features that uh, those two personalities had in common was not only unusual versatility in economic and monetary analysis, of course, but a supreme sense of service and of uh, independence of mind. And Paolo Baffi was a very rigorous uh, deputy uh, uh, governor and uh, first director general of the Bank of Italy who had to pay a price for that. And uh, uh, Alberto was not only a great economist as uh, these two day scientific conferences has uh, attested uh, 360 degrees, but he also, he also had a great sense of independence, the passion of his ideas, the willingness to discuss his ideas with those of others, and uh, he was not ready to concessions, uh, if not after a very uh, difficult, uh, uh, long uh, uh, discussion in which normally he prevailed. And this spirit of independence, of course, uh, uh, showed especially when the person with whom he discussed was uh, um, somebody who for age or status or temporary position was uh, uh, above him, never intellectually. And I, I must say that uh, for these reasons, in particular age, I had uh, the pleasure of being uh, quite often the target of his very punctual critiques, normally with the, the, the supposed to be moderator on his uh, sideline, Francesco Giavazzi. And uh, of course, the fact that he could do this with uh, the guy that was his mentor at this university, then European commissioner, then uh, at the time uh, Prime Minister, I believe displayed to his conscience to the maximum possible degree uh, the fact that he was really being independent. This was sometimes annoying in the very short term, but always extremely helpful in retrospect, because whether he or they were right or not, which is totally irrelevant uh, here, there was always a great stimulation to look at things on their merit. And I like to believe that this spirit of independence, which is the opposite of the um, tendency to always please those in higher offices, he may have taken from this university and not only from the village of Broni. Let me conclude these remarks by noting that uh, the panel that is about to start is on uh, economic policy uh, in an age of uncertainty. I must say, we had a, an age of uncertainty a few decades ago. Otherwise, how could one explain that some Italian economists born intellectually at that time have been so successful in their academic careers throughout the world? I believe because they were studying and working in a place which, a which was a concentrated laboratory of all possible distortions in, uh, in, at that time. For example, the title of Alberto's thesis was Inflation, Indexation and Stability, a Theoretical Analysis. Uh, in, at that time, 
another very different type of economist, but also very distinguished, who also I had the honor to supervise in his thesis, Nouriel Rubini, has, has the, his thesis on the interaction between the rate of exchange and the rate of inflation, the hypothesis of the vicious circle. And Guido Tabellini uh, did something very related to that on the microeconomic foundations of financial intermediaries. Now, we will hear uh, on, on the panel now, in, in an age of uncertainty, may I venture to say that in some respects, the uncertainties which are in front of policymakers right now have something similar to what the situation at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s was. For example, in Italy, one uh, milestone of uh, the improvements of economic policies was precisely in 1982, the so-called divorce between the Bank of Italy and the Treasury, which disentangled some co uh, complex functions in overall uh, economic policy making. Now, so many years later, maybe there are some similar uh, problems and uh, the complexities of uh, um, using uh, different policy instruments uh, for different situations, of course, are today also compounded by the fact that luckily many of our countries are deeply integrated in the European Union. Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Thank you, dear members of the panel which we are all impatient to see start. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to invite on stage Prime Minister Mario Draghi, Professor Lawrence Summers, Professor Silvana Tenreiro, and Mr. Lionel Barber for the panel discussion on economy policy in an age of uncertainty. Thank you. I, I'm supposed to say, well, Um, I think I'll have to say something before that was stalled. Um, before starting, I would like to say something to commemorate, to remember Alberto. And... Uh, I would like us to be all in, united uh, for the terrible tragedy that took place yesterday in Texas. So may our souls be like with those of ch those children and parents and people who have unfortunately disappeared. Well, it's a great honor for me <clears throat> to be here to commemorate Alberto. I want to thank, uh, first of all, Alberto's wife, Susan, and then Francesco Giarazzi was a real force behind this event, and President Monti and Rector Verona for the whole event and this organization. Alberto Alesina was one of the brightest and most influential economists of his generation. His intuitions had a profound impact beyond ac academia and contributed to shape policy across the world. Take, for example, his research on inflation, which was instrumental, I would say, I think fundamental, for the central bank independence to be accepted as uh, 
an undisputable superior concept of central banking. I, I know that maybe Larry doesn't agree completely about this, but we'll discuss this in a moment. Alessina was never afraid of controversies and tackled them with rigor, open-mindedness, originality, his relentless curiosity, ranging from history to sociology and anthropology, drove his research in new and exciting directions. He was one of the first economists to look at the correlation between inequality, economic growth, and political conflict. And while he was a staunch supporter of the free market, he was concerned about reduced social mobility, which became a central theme in his work. <coughs> Alessina was an outstanding mentor to a large number of students and young academics and a leading voice in the public debate. His columns on Corriere della Sera were essential reading for anyone involved in policy and government regardless of their ideas. He was a driving force at Harvard, at the National Bureau of Economic Research, at the CPR, and in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. And he was a source of inspiration for many, full of life, self-deprecating, with an extraordinary team spirit. At this, as this conference shows, his intellectual legacy is huge, just like his heart. We miss him terribly, but we must cherish the time we were lucky enough to spend with him. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening. Uh, everyone here. It's a great honor for me to be moderating this panel discussion, to be here in Milan at Bocconi amongst some old friends. And as a former newspaper editor, um, you'll forgive me if I can't resist editing the title of this discussion because it should be economic policy in an age of radical uncertainty because We've had, if you think about it, in the last two or three years, the plague, now a war, and if not famine, certainly serious food shortages uh, arising from the conflict and war in Ukraine. So, and then we of course have the return of 1970s style inflation that Mario Monti was referring to earlier. So I'm going to turn, first of all, um, to Larry Summers to give us a, a little bit of an insight into this bigger picture and perhaps offering some judicious um, judgments, uh, if you can have that, on policy making to date, Larry. Thank you very much, Lionel. And before I say anything else, uh, I just want to say that the kind of collection of people who have come here uh, today, a prime minister, a former prime minister, sitting uh, ministers, so many others, is an enormous tribute to the life Alberto led. And it's also a tribute to the type of life that he led, the scholarly engaged uh, life that believed that better scholarship, better understanding, more rigor, analysis and application of data could really make the world a better place. And I can't think of anyone who better exemplified that credo than Alberto Alessina. And I only wish he could be here to see how much of a difference he made in how many people's uh, lives. I want to start with uh, the area that Alberto and I, the one area that Alberto and I worked uh, together on, and that was the question of central banking 
uh, independence, where Alberto had done the pioneering work demonstrating that independent central banks uh, generated outcomes with lower inflation. And Alberto and I together tried to clinch the argument by making the point that uh, economists would call nominal neutrality, that that lower inflation did not come with higher unemployment or more volatile business cycles or more variation in real exchange rates or anything else that was adverse. I believe Alberto, along with many others who pioneered the political economy of dynamic consistency issues um, and made the case for the independence of central banks and for the emphasis on that as reinforcing uh, credibility have a great deal to do with the fact that we enjoyed globally 40 years of price uh, stability from the early, from 35 to 40 years, from the early mid 1980s until uh, now. It is stunning to me how little graduate students know about inflation. And that's kind of like the fact that medical students don't know anything uh, much about smallpox. It's a reflection of substantial success. Unfortunately, though, success breeds complacency. New generations of policymakers desire that they at least will make new mistakes rather than the same old ones. And so speaking for a moment for the United States, I think we lost our way in uh, 2021. After a decade in which chronically low aggregate demand had been a problem, we decided that more aggregate demand was good and the most aggregate demand was better. And blowing out aggregate demand would uh, be best. We took an economy with a GDP gap that could plausibly have been estimated to be 2% of GDP. We ran a 15%, 12 to 15% extra GDP deficit. Uh, stimulus. At the same time, we ran zero interest rates. At the same time, we bought securities at an unprecedented pace, including mortgage-backed uh, securities, uh, even as house prices boomed. At the same time, we opened up and allowed a big overhang of savings to be spent. Should anyone have been surprised when that proved to be substantially inflationary? Should anyone have been surprised that when the inflation came, it was much more pronounced in some sectors than it was in other sectors? I don't think anyone should have been terribly surprised. There's room to debate the extent to which there was an error in fiscal policy versus the extent to which there was an error in uh, monetary uh, policy, but I don't think there's much room to debate that there were very substantial errors made for which we're likely to pay a price. And it was because we failed to heed the lessons of Alberto's uh, research in terms of the importance of institutions that fomented responsible policy that were paying that price. Hi. Thank, thank you, Larry. I've, I've just run out of paper. 
given the length of the charge sheet. Um, uh, Prime Minister, I'm not going to ask you, put you in the invidious position of looking back uh, a couple of years, um, but I do want to hear, and I think the audience would be very interested in your description and analysis of the pan-European policy response to this multiple crisis, energy prices, inflation, food shock, war. Mm -hmm. Can I say just one word uh, oh, as yes. an add-up to what Larry just said? Oh, be my guest. Um, one, one thing uh, that we should uh, hope for is that, uh, well, it's taken 10 years for Paul Volcker to come out and uh, to uh, root out the expectations that were in, have been ingrained over 10 years. Hopefully this is going to happen faster this time. The second observation that I'm going to make just very quickly is that Europe's, Europe is different. The uh, situation here is different, uh, um, and only because inflation is much lower, uh, core inflation is much, much lower, um, and, um, and the fiscal expansion is, um, is, is not what's been in the United States by far. It's been much less. So uh, the two situations are different. Now, I come to your point. But I, I think I'll, Silvana will comment on that Indeed. after that. So um, the, the um, yes, I mentioned this pragmatic federalism in a speech in Strasbourg recently. Um, the point is this. Europe is now being called to entirely new roles in the world. It's quite clear that uh, uh, Europe needs to build its defense. I'm just starting with that, but I might have started with the energy transition or the uh, ecological transition or the health transition or so on and so forth. The pandemia has taught us that uh, single individual countries cannot cope with certain problems. And uh, that's true for all the problems, the issues that I've just mentioned. And it's going to be truer and truer for other things. So uh, rather than pursuing uh, dreams of, uh, say, uh, 360 degrees federalism that starts with creating new political institutions, which in the end, at least in my view, that's the end game, certainly. One could start thinking about separate issues, separate problems, challenges that need to be addressed. And uh, that will drive by itself towards the search for new institutions. For example, again, take the defense issue. Defense issue, by the way, let me say that to, to say that we have to organize our defense, which is absolutely going to be complementary to the NATO one, it, it doesn't require first and foremost to spend more for defense. As you may know, we spend about three times as much as Russia. So it does take first and foremost coordination. But coordination of defense will easily bring together a coordination of foreign policies more than it is today and coordination of defense policy and coordination of logistics and coordination of production of, in, of uh, defense weapons and so on and so forth. So the, the, here the, 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 the pragmatic federalism consists in finding a practical issue that we need to address, practical challenge that we need to address if Europe has to have any meaning in this world. And then move from there. I think that's, that's what I meant by, by that. And uh, so the, by, I stop here. Just a brief um, follow-up. Yeah. So you, you are in favor, though, of a, uh, a reopening of the treaties, a treaty yeah. dis discussion. Do you think that the majority of EU member states favor that view? And is it easier without perfidious Albion, better known as the UK? Well, I think so. That's, that's for sure. Uh, but, uh, but that's not enough. 
um, I think that other countries will want to go gradually more or even more slowly. But that means that really uh, asks the question, how could Europe perform the role that it's being called to play? How could Europe address the challenges that has to face without a greater federalism? And frankly, I, I would say I, ha I don't see any answer to that unless we move forward on that path. Now, the central banks, um, let me be blunt. Do you believe that all the central banks, including the Bank of England, were behind the curve when it came to uh, raising interest rates? And in that context, how would you describe the current policy response in the UK, and more generally. Okay, so um, so let, let me start from uh, the basics. Uh, shocks or sequence of shocks to energy and commodity prices is not something that we can reliably forecast, let alone those that are coming from an unexpected war. Um, so there's no way we could have predicted this uh, big increase in, uh, in uh, energy and, and commodity prices more generally that are a big part of the inflation landscape today, uh, both in Europe and in the UK. The US situation is different because they are large, they're a large producer of commodities, of course. Uh, but just to be clear, commodity markets and a whole industry dedicated to price futures um, um, markets were not seeing this coming. Um, now, we cannot, we cannot predict shocks. Uh, that's why they are shocks. They are unpredictable. What monetary policy can and should do in line with their remits is, when confronted with the shocks, uh, return inflation to target in the medium term, the two, three years horizon. Um, but let's, let's assume for now, and this is very hypothetical, that we, would, we had anticipated the shock, um, including the war in Ukraine. Um, now, I ran these numbers in a, in a recent talk I gave uh, to fully offset the inflation, uh, expansionary inflation that we, we see today, we would have needed to uh, see double-digit unemployment. Given the lags with which monetary policy affects the economy, we should have started tightening and generating this large unemployment in the midst of the pandemic crisis, when the crisis, when the pandemic was still not under control. And as you recall, a main rationale for the policy response during the crisis was to avert mass unemployment and uh, massive closures of firms so that uh, we prevent the, the deep scarring or hysteresis that we saw before uh, in other episodes. And, uh, so the whole rationale was to limit that and ensure that the supply capacity of the economy was not damaged because of a, what should be a temporary shock. Um, so in, in, in that spirit, uh, monetary policy was uh, aiming uh, to do that. As I said, we would have needed to start much earlier, if, uh, but, but that would have been inconsistent with our remits. Uh, not only, um, if, again, we try to offset a commodity price shock of, of the nature of what we are seeing, um, that would generate an, a massive undershoot in inflation once this commodity pros, um, um, shock unwinds or uh, stops accelerating. And I should be clear that the perspective from the UK and, and Europe in general is perhaps different from the, from, uh, uh, from the US. For us, uh, as net importers of energy and commodities, this represents a negative terms of trade shock. And as a consequence of that, we are poorer, and this will manifest itself in lower real wages and lower demand. So past this bump in prices, we should see you know, a, a negative effect on demand. Of course, the risk is that these spikes in prices feed into an inflationary um, dynamics, uh, price setting dyma dynamics, that, uh, and, and that's where monetary policy has to act. And that's uh, why, in the case of the Bank of England, we have uh, uh, raised ri rates recently. Looking ahead, we, we do face a, a very fine balance in, in adjusting these tensions because aggregate demand will, um, will be depressed by this shock. So I, I, I suspect if Alberto were listening, 
he would have noticed a general um, comfortable consensus that in, there is inflation, but it's also very different conditions in America and Europe. But let me ask you, and I think I'll come to Larry and ask the same question. Um, if, the, if there is inflation, surely workers will respond to that fact, and we may get uh, something like 1970s wage push inflation on top of other factors like energy. Yeah, I mean, th there are two differences from the 70s that I would like to highlight. One is that in the 70s, there was no this uh, very strong and robust monetary policy framework that we have now with an inflation targeting uh, um, uh, framework that is very clear. And monetary policy makers know what they are doing now. Um, back in the 70s, we were still, we were still exploring uh, income policies. And, and in the end, I mean, we know that um, income policies cannot replace a strong and robust monetary policy um, in target, in, uh, inflation targeting framework. Um, uh, it's ultimately policy that um, bears down on demand and affects inflation. The other difference was obviously uh, union power but was much higher in the 70s and, and workers now will, will find themselves in, in a very uh, difficult situation because uh, they will be facing very stark choices and uh, their real incomes will have, I mean, will suffer. I mean, it's that, that part will not be averted by any monetary policy. Um, uh, and again, if we, even if we had started earlier, or perhaps even more if we had started earlier, real wages would be even lower now. Larry? Let me say three things. Uh, first, yes, the United States is very different from Europe or the UK very different in terms of the amount of fiscal stimulus, very different in terms of the way relationships between employers and employees were broken during COVID, and most obviously very different by the fall in the degree of the tightness of labor markets. So the situations really are uh, quite different. Second, uh, people have this odd view about hysteresis. Um, there's like the nice part of hysteresis and there's the not nice part of hysteresis. The nice part of hysteresis is recessions cast a shadow forward that means lower potential output, therefore it's really important to avoid recessions. That's the nice part. The not nice part is after you've had a recession, potential output is lower. And so you can maintain a lower level of output than you used to think because you've taken this hit to potential uh, inflate, uh, output, and if you try to maintain the same level of potential output, then you will overheat the economy. And what I've noticed is that almost every hysteresis advocate forgets their enthusiasm for hysteresis once the recession ends, because what they really are is advocates for expansion all the time. And what we've learned is that that can be uh, quite painful. So I think we have to be very careful about these uh, hysteresis arguments. The third thing I would say is that I think we need to be careful about central bankers who are proud of their frameworks. The United States Central Bank, without any noticeable tut-tutting from the rest of the central banking community, announced in September, in August of 2020, that its new framework was we were no longer going to ever apply monetary restraint because we anticipated inflation, even though monetary policy acts with a lag. In case that wasn't enough, that even if there was inflation, we weren't going to apply monetary restraint until we were absolutely for sure, for sure, that the economy was completely at full employment. And even then, we were going to say that it was okay to have above target inflation afterwards, as long as we'd had below target inflation for a while. That feels like a framework of shifting from 
The old idea that we remove the punch bowl just as the party is getting good, to a new idea that we keep the punch bowl going until the first person has been taken to the hospital with alcohol poisoning. And it seems to me that it was kind of predictable that that would lead to a more inflationary environment. I think if people had sort of heeded Alberto's emphasis on the political economy of it all and the emphasis of others on the possibility of the radical uncertainty you referred to, we wouldn't have announced a framework of uh, that kind. And frankly, I think that the US Fed is sufficiently salient in the world of central banks that it has reputational externalities to the rest of the central banking community. And so when it announces a new framework and it becomes less credible, that affects everybody else's credibility um, as well. So I, I get very nervous when a central banker says it's all going to be okay because we have our framework. And I have to say that the Bank of England's serenity in the summer of 2021 is not in the spring of 2022 looking to have been borne out. Can I, can I come up to this? Uh, I think I'm you not should. saying everything will be okay, Larry. I'm saying that we faced a very difficult trade off. And um, in a time of uncertainty, however radical or not it is, um, you need to play with risks. So early in the pandemic, again, the biggest risk was permanent firms closures and uh, mass unemployment. And there was a decision uh, made there that, you know, that's the one to avert. Uh, there were risks on the opposite side, um, perhaps not early because, you know, early on, as you remember, commodity prices were falling and that um, fell down on, on CPI uh, indices. But, uh, but uh, obviously there was a risk that eventually th that would mean demand pushing against a constrained um, supply. Um, and over time, the balance of, she of uh, risk dipped towards the inflationary side, but uh, it's, it's, um, I, I, I guess um, um, with hindsight, you can perhaps time it uh, a little bit later or earlier, but uh, we're not talking about um, qualitatively different, different responses here. And just to be clear, mm -hmm. you, you also said several times that the price in terms of unemployment in the UK was near di double digit. Right, nine percent. Well, if you wanted to, which would really have been upset. three times what it was. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not defending you, but I'm just. No, no, no. If <laughs> if you really want to, over, you know, offset the overshooting inflation caused by commodity prices, yeah. that's you need to bear down on domestic demand and cost. But I, I and thought, I thought the former governor of the ECB had it exactly. Who is had it exactly. <laughs> you <laughs> had it. Um, had it exactly right in his intervention here when he said that it was really important to act fast for credibility, like in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And the longer you waited and the more you hesitated, the more expectations got entrenched and the more expensive it was. So I don't think uh, the nurse who pulls off your Band-Aid slowly and gently does you any great favor. And I think the question uh, with respect to inflation is uh, goes uh, goes to how quickly you should how quickly you should adopt and if you believe it's all transitory then you're right but the transitory view isn't looking so good isn't looking so good uh, right now maybe geopolitical events will play out in the next few months in a way that makes it look good so let me just widen the scope of the discussion for a moment. There's an awful lot of perhaps loose talk about, oh, it's a terrible word, deglobalization. De um, I much prefer conscious decoupling. Um, do you think that that, how do you assess this, this problem of East and West pulling apart um, China, wanting to become more, more autarkic, 
more self-reliant. Um, and I am going to come to you, Silvana, because I know you've done some serious work on nearshoring and supply chains. But just from, the, from your Rome perspective. The, um, the geopolitical trends seem to point to, um, I would say, a situation of serious tension. Whether this translates itself into the deglobalization of the economies, uh, it's to be seen. I mean, so far, we see some sectors like energy, um, mostly energy, really, that's linked to the geopolitical uh, and the war in Ukraine. Um, the grains and the wheat, certainly. Uh, the rest, um, in, in spite of the great conflicts with China, continues to, to be what it was. Um, but certainly, the, the geopolitical tensions call for uh, interferences in, uh, in the sort of globalized markets. Uh, we see that we want to contain certain Chinese technologies. That's a constant discussion. Uh, Especially with the Americans. Yeah, with the Americans, but also in Europe. And the United Kingdom, by the way, it's been, uh, it's been like that. Uh, we are now, but for instance, take, take the case of energy now. For now, we face, we finally faced this, uh, this de in Italy, this uh, dependence, uh, economic uh, energy dependence from Russia, uh, that it's now threatened to become um, submission rather than dependence. So the um, immediate response is to prepare a future where we are not going to depend on the Russians for gas. So, so you globalize. I mean, you actually use globalization here. You go around the world. We went all over Africa buying gas. We went all over the world to buy, to buy the ships, the degasifiers, uh, and so on. In this way, you see, it's hard to say that deglobalization is just one-way street. Um, there are responses that I, at least I am not an expert, but I find hard to categorize in a, in a way. Um, that's what I would say now. But I think uh, Silvana wants to say, Silvana's done a lot of work on that. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, yeah, so and we, what we find in, in, in our work is that uh, international trade or globalization uh, tends to reduce volatility in many countries because it, it allows countries to diversify risks across suppliers and across uh, buyers. And uh, I think trade diversification will become more important um, as, as we face more extreme weather events with climate change and you know, energy, the energy area is, is a particularly important one uh, on which uh, the results point to in the direction of, of more globalization in order to reduce volatility. I think the risk that, and what we hear today is an argument that in order to build resilience, we, we should reshore, but that seems to be the wrong logic. Uh, reshore where the, uh, are there particular favored destinations, do you think? Within the country. Or so as it? if I think the premise there is that there's more exposure to your own risks, but uh, you know, the, the logic of diversification is that instead you're really putting right. all the eggs on one basket. Please. Just, just, uh, go, sorry, ahead, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I have and then about man attacking this question of global management, coordinated economic management. This is, would be good. You know, I guess my attitude is that sometimes these analogies are right and sometimes these analogies are wrong. But suppose you thought about a company, just to make it concrete. If you're an automobile company, you need to have steering wheels for your cars. If, you don't, if the car doesn't have a steering wheel, the rest of the car can be great, but there's no steering wheel. So if you were totally dependent on one supplier of steering wheels, you could have a real problem if they somehow decided to cut off selling steering wheels to you. They could put you completely out of business and they could hold you up. So there are three responses you could have to that problem. One problem, one thing you could do is decide to have five suppliers. And so if one of them cut you off, you'd just go to the other four and they'd be done. Another thing you could do 
is hold two months of supplies of steering wheels in your inventory. So if they cut you off, it would be kind of expensive uh, for them for um, a, long, uh, a long time. Another thing you could do is decide that you were going to make your own steering wheels and that you were going to build a steering wheel factory next to your automobile factory. I think most of us would tend to say that the third was kind of a last resort strategy and that you should really try to do the first two strategies if you can in order to uh, have resilience. And I guess I think that captures something very real for, and I think this is the point of uh, Savannah's research, um, for uh, countries that, yes, you may want to do a certain amount of reshoring, but let's emphasize diversifying, let's emphasize inventorying, and let's remember that globalization is two-edged. We have like a big deal, classic one of these problems right now in the United States with respect to infant formula. If we hadn't had a 17.5% tariff against European infant formula, we would have suppliers who had a set of ongoing relationships with European suppliers. If we hadn't had a set of goofy rules in which states procure um, procure in ways that are non-competitive and single source, we wouldn't be having this problem. So infant formula stands as an example, not of why it would be better to deshore or, or reshore, but stands as an example of why it would be better um, to uh, do something else. I think we're better off in a world where we have stronger norms of maintaining commerce, maintaining trade routes, keeping uh, things open. And I think if everybody decides that good fences make good neighbors, it's going to be very hard to maintain norms. <coughs> and that's ultimately going to lead to more conflict. And we've got a test case. Even Keynes in 1932 basically said maybe we should have less global integration and it'll all work better and the world will stay at peace. That didn't work out so well. And it didn't work out so well in the Atlantic and it worked out dramatically poorly uh, in uh, the Pacific. And so Keynes changed his mind. And I think he was right the second time. You're going to come in. Norms and uh, especially trade rules and trade norms have been, um, have been damaged by the experience we had uh, over the last, um, makes about four or five years, six years. Um, much of the, well, some of the damage has been done by the disrespect of these norms by large uh, countries especially, I would say, China. Um, but then we had, uh, with, uh, we had a, a president of the United States, which, uh, which really uh, made its mission to destroy the uh, order, and not only on trade issues, but on many other issues, the order upon which the uh, growth and prosperity after the Second World War was built. And, uh, and then we had the COVID, and then we had the war with Russia. So it, it, it's a long period of time during which these rules are not really respected, are not felt as being important. And so the first thing we've got to do, uh, regardless of these trends of deglobalization, is to reestablish those rules, to rediscover that uh, this multilateral order is the basis of our prosperity. And whether it's going to be the, always the basis for peace or not, I'm not sure. It, it has shown to be such, but maybe it was a coincidence, or maybe it was due to other factors. But I don't think we should ask ourselves this, 
The primary thing is to rebuild the basis of our prosperity, because while there may be doubts that multilateralism brings peace, I believe so, but many don't. Uh, there is no doubt whatsoever that multilateral rules bring growth, bring prosperity. So that's, that's I think, the first item on, on, our, on our global agenda that we should take up as soon as, <laughs> that sounds, as soon as the geopolitical issues, or actually, why to wait for that? As a matter of fact, it would be another manifestation of a global alliance to reestablish these rules. And, but this, you see, this, this, now that I think on it, of course, the China's presence in this is essential. So you see the geopolitics and the reestablishment of these rules are intertwined. At the same time, I think, if one looks at that more modestly, uh, the, the, the reform of the World Trade Organization is, uh, is overdue. And I think most people would agree with that. Even the Chinese, I think, do. So that is one, one thing to do first. What might be the right forum for such a discussion, given you have a, a, a problem with the G20, you have a, a sl somewhat of a problem with the G7, which doesn't include I think we, uh, well, it, uh, on the, the G20 is, no, the G7 is certainly not the, the right forum. I don't know what Larry thinks. Larry's been part of the G7 uh, for many years in various capacities, but I, as far as I understand, no, it would not be the right forum. Um, the G20 might be better, but it now has having this uh, crisis that divides the world. Uh, the some, some ad hoc group for the re, for reforming the world trade rules could be could be another. And I, I don't think it would actually face much opposition to do that. If one if one thing um, could be useful now is to sort of not continue playing on the same agenda that would naturally calls for the same conflicts uh, and, and has a past. I think one should turn around the agenda, set a mo well, modest, it's not a modest goal, but it's a precise, well-defined goal. And I'm confident that most, most of the world would adhere to this. I Do you think, I, please. Yeah. If there was one thing that I'd like to be able to ask Alberto today, it would be about the domestic political economy in major countries of support for responsible global policies and what his thoughts are as to why it has deteriorated so much and what could be done uh, to rebuild it because I think it's a central challenge. I think there's a central challenge of finding ways of connecting a global agenda that looks like it benefits people in Detroit and Dusseldorf more than it benefits people in Davos. And I was particularly encouraged. I thought the best thing that happened in economic diplomacy in the last couple of years was the agreement on global tax cooperation. Because the idea there was that, you know, plutocratic capital can run, but it can't hide. And that it's going to have to pay taxes to somebody uh, no matter uh, what it does. Unfortunately, the US Congress is looking like it's not going to do the things that are necessary uh, to uh, enable it. I read a statistic today that just, that just incredibly discouraged me. At the last US ASEAN summit, the U.S. committed for infrastructure and global integration, $150 million. And the author of this rather clever uh, piece, might have been in the FT, I don't know, pointed out that that was enough to buy one and a half kilometers of the Tokyo subway. And I thought it was a dramatic way of pointing up uh, the inadequacy of what it was uh, that we were uh, that we were doing. Indeed. Do you have 
Just, just to agree that we need to find a way to rebuild that cooperation. Uh, we face, you know, right now an urgent problem, particularly in developing countries with increasing um, the pri food prices. Um, Ukraine and Russia are big producers of wheat. Prices of wheat have increased by 70% in the past 12, uh, 12 months. Um, that has spilled over to other commodities. This is, this is a huge human, humanitarian uh, crisis for um, the developing world. Um, past this, of course, we need, again, the cooperation to think about climate change, and there's, there's a whole host of uh, uh, uncertainties that would need to be uh, addressed, and, and, and for that, we will need strong cooperation. I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, but I'd, I, I think it would be useful to close off this conversation, which has been really fascinating, um, to talk about, and hopefully this, this is relevant, um, not least to Alberto, that the contribution and the role of academic research and people with academic backgrounds, strong academic backgrounds, going into policy making. And Larry, obviously, you, you occupied two very serious roles, uh, well, actually, more than two, um, in successive administrations. What, what are your thoughts? I've got both wise guy thoughts and serious thoughts. Uh, Try the wise as, guy. First. As a professor at Harvard, the worst thing you can do is to sign your name to something you didn't write yourself. As a rising bureaucrat in the Treasury, the more frequently you're able to do that, the more effective you are as, um, <laughs> as an operator. As a professor, you're judged by the best thing you do. And if you write articles that aren't very interesting or that turn out to be wrong, nobody much cares if you do some things that are great. As a policymaker, you're likely to be judged by your biggest blunder. And so the art of policy making is profoundly different from the art of being a professor and that's why it always seems to me that Alberto had it right. Alberto wasn't trying to kibitz ever on the next piece of legislation that was passing through the Congress or was passing through the European Parliament. He understood that sitting at Harvard or Bocconi, he had no comparative advantage in that. He was trying to define the agenda and the frameworks that would be used uh, for uh, the next 20 years. And I think that's immensely uh, important. I guess that, and I think Alberto, from the conversations I had with him, uh, towards the very end of his uh, life was, I think, moving in a direction that was more micro and less macro. Uh, the research he was doing with Stephanie Stancheva on uh, the attitudes of actual people who don't actually think in terms of the categories that economists think in terms of. So if you sort of ask them about, like, what do you think the trade-off is between efficiency and equity? They're like, I don't know what you're talking about. But if you put it in terms of what do you think about this and what do you think about that, there is a preference system there that you can understand. I thought that was fundamentally important uh, research. I think there's fundamentally important research to be done on why government is so often so ineffective at uh, doing uh, really important uh, things well, and that as more and more things are gonna fall into the remit of government, getting it to function better is gonna become uh, that much uh, more important. But above all, I think Alberto's influence uh, shows um, that uh, while everybody in government feels themselves incredibly busy and incredibly decisive, they're actually operating within a framework 
that was created by the prevailing social science understandings of 10 years before. And that's what makes his work so profoundly important and live on uh, after him. Your thoughts, Prime Minister, given um, I've always thought that substance mattered, but then I'm just a journalist. <laughs> yeah, substance matters. Uh, if I, um, frankly, I, I kind of try not to ask myself how important uh, has been my previous experience uh, as a professor of economics. Um, and people ask me that, so I had to answer. Um, more, I, I would say that more, the, um, uh, more than thinking about models and, um, and the assumptions behind them, uh, the, uh, what I got from my previous experience is the, the way people in uh, academia interact. First, if you, ask, if you are asked a question, you answer. Uh, you, don't, I mean, you don't fudge, you answer. And if you don't have an answer, you say, I don't know. That's surprising in the rest of the world, but it's normal. It's normal in, in, in the university and academic profession. Um, second, if you um, give an answer, you explain why. And uh, I, I never thought or asked or assumed that I would be taken seriously for being what I am. So you just answer, and better answer clearly, otherwise people won't believe you. And uh, third, and that pertains exclusively to the policy making, uh, and, but also in a sense, the, you've got to be consistent with what you say. I mean, if you say that certain things are going to happen, they must happen because credibility, and now I speak, I'm sorry, as a former central bank governor, is the essence. That's why I always said, stay within your mandate. That's a different discussion. But that's part of the central bank governor or president credibility. That's the same thing. It's part and parcel of your policymaker credibility. You have a mandate which is given by the voters, the electorate, or in my case, by the president of the republic and the parliament that voted for my government. And that's the mandate. And uh, I stay within that. But more importantly, if anything, facts have to follow words. Thank you. It's going to be hard to beat that. <laughs> I will agree fully. I think so. I think, uh, uh, and especially in the context of central banks and central bank independence, on which Alberto wrote, and uh, uh, it's super important that we stick to our mandates, and uh, they are very clear. Silvani, so, you have the last word. It's been a great pleasure for, uh, to moderate this conference, uh, an honour, and thank you very much, everyone on the panel for contributing to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Please remain in your seat. Please remain in your seats. The event has not finished.
Kecap ini ke Mater Kecap Mater Kecap tuh 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 Kecap Ladies and gentlemen, the floor to the rector of Bocconi University, Gianmario Verona. So, so we come to the final part uh, of this, uh, uh, this conference and this uh, uh, important event. Let me again thank one more time uh, President Draghi for having shared with us uh, uh, some important uh, insights uh, on uh, economic policy in an age of uncertainty. Let me thank Professor Summers and Professor Tenreiro, and thank, let me thank so much uh, Lionel Barber for having moderated uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, tribute event. Uh, we are moving to the conclusion, and uh, as we said, uh, Alberto Alesina was really a special, a special person, and uh, I'm seeing here uh, uh, some of his... Uh, uh, colleagues uh, that have co-authored papers with him, that have, uh, you know, spent most of his life with him, and he's been a special person. I, mean, I guess that's even uh, Mario Draghi mentioned the importance of his impact, and I would say more generally that uh, his role as uh, a scholar has been great, both as a researcher, but also, as we said before, as a teacher. And for these reasons, uh, the Board of Trustees of Bocconi University uh, has unanimously decided to honor his memory by dedicating him a, a room, which is a very special room because we have plenty of classrooms at Bocconi University, but uh, we thought that the best way to remember uh, Alberto was uh, uh, by uh, dedicating him a seminar room, which is exactly the place where, uh, you know, uh, scientists meet uh, uh, when they present papers and so when there is a lot of discussion and debate and more specifically of course it will be the seminar room in the fifth floor of the department uh, of uh, uh, economics uh, and so this is something very special and unique for Alberto and so we will remember forever him with this uh, with this special with this special uh, room so uh, I guess that uh, we have a video that uh, uh, will remember Alberto and then I will call on the podium Susanna Lezina and Francesco Giavazzi for some final remarks. Let's see the video.
Bocconi, passo sempre del tempo a parlare, incontrare gli studenti della Bocconi che sono assolutamente straordinari e ogni anno ne arrivano nei nostri dottorati migliori degli Stati Uniti una quantità credo superiore a qualunque altra università nel mondo. Let me call here Susanna Lesina and Francesco Giavazzi. I know Susan, you would like to, to say a few words. Thank you. So the podium for you. I would like to thank Prime Minister Draghi for being here this afternoon. Good afternoon, President Monti, Rector Verona, Professor Giovazzi. Good afternoon to the tribute panel speakers and good afternoon to friends and distinguished guests. It is difficult for me to find the, to find the words to express the multitude of emotions surrounding the dedication of this seminar room to my late husband, Alberto Alessina. Despite the sadness that we are gathering today in memory of Alberto rather than with him, there is a great sense of honor that Alberto is being commemora commemorated by Bocconi for many decades to come. And there is a sense of academic continuity as generations of new scholars will gather in this seminar room to share and debate countless issues that were so central to Alberto's own career. As all of you know, Alberto and Bocconi shared a very special relationship. I do not think it is an exaggeration to say that attending Bocconi as an undergraduate student literally changed the trajectory of Alberto's life. As a Bocconi student in the late 1970s, Alberto had the opportunity to, stun, to study under and with some of the best and brightest econom economic minds of Europe. Alberto was exposed to new ideas and novel ways of thinking, opening intellectual possibilities he had never imagined. Soon after beginning his undergraduate studies, Alberto was inspired by the examples of his own professors to begin to envision an academic career for himself. The professors at Bocconi provided the intellectual foundation and encouragement to let him dream big. And Alberto's classmates provided the support and friendship that nurtured him through the inevitable challenges that any student faces in such a rigorous program. There's a charming story Alberto used to share about his process for, of applying to doctoral programs in the United States. After completing his studies at Bocconi, Alberto began his military service. One of his assignments was to guard the armory, the building where the guns and ammunition were stored. During his breaks, Alberto sat on a wooden bench and wrote his applications in longhand, in pencil. There were no laptop computers back then. It was an unusual situation, a young scholar dressed as a soldier, guarding weapons, and writing about his dreams of becoming an economist. He wrote about his passion for macroeconomics and how Bocconi had sparked his interest in pursuing an advanced degree. One of his proudest moments was when he was able to tell his academic advisor, Professor Mario Monti, the news of his acceptance to study in the PhD program at Harvard University. Professor Monti, I know Alberto remained grateful throughout his life for your guidance and support, and I know he took great pride in observing your numerous accomplishments. We all know Alberto went on to have a distinguished and prolific academic career, collaborating with so many colleagues present here today. Bocconi was an integral part of Alberto's life and work. He looked forward to coming back and spending time here on a regular basis. In fact, he planned much of his work and commitments at Harvard University around Bocconi's schedule so he could be here during the semester to teach and interact with faculty. Alberto thrived here and was refreshed by the environment at Bocconi. 
Coming to Bocconi to teach and conduct research was also a way for Alberto to make a direct contribution to his alma mater, alma mater and to Italy, his beloved country. He especially loved working with Bocconi students. He strived to motivate them and to challenge them and to give them the same sort of encouragements he had received from his professors decades before. A great joy for Alberto and for me was to welcome Bocconi students at our home every year when they moved on to study at Harvard or other universities in the Boston area. I am joined here today by Alberto's sister, Roberta Elezina, and her family. Roberta and I are so grateful to Bocconi for dedicating a seminar room in memory of Alberto. I am 100% certain that the Alberto Elezina room will be a special place to foster academic and policy, debate, and policy debate, as well as to perpetuate his legacy of intellectual creativity. I am sure that Alberto would be delighted to know he has a home at Bocconi forever. Roberta and I are also grateful for the establishment of the scholarship fund named after Alberto. Providing access to education for young scholars is directly linked to advancing Bocconi's mission as a preeminent institution for training the next generation of the world's greatest economists. Alberto would have been wholeheartedly supportive of these activities. Roberta and I look forward to contributing to this scholarship for many years to come. Thank you all for being here this, eve this afternoon and for participating in this special program. It is certainly an exceptional way to celebrate the life of a man who inspired so many of us and who his friends, colleagues, family, and I loved so much. Thank you very much. Many things have been said today in, in the conference the past couple of days about Alberto. The one thing that has not been said, uh, famous economists, and Alberto is clearly one of them, uh, typically run away from uh, administrative duties in universities. You ask them to be department chair, they say, no, no, no way I can do this. I have too many papers to write. Um, Alberto was chairman of the economics department at Harvard. At a, I guess St Stephanie will know this better than me, but it's a very special moment of the department. This is not usual. We know of many uh, wonderful uh, economists. Andre is one of them. Andre would never accept to be chairman at Harvard. <laughs> uh, but this is important because this shows one aspect of, uh, of Alberto, which is uh, his dedication to, uh, to institutions. Uh, it has been repeated that uh, together with the um, intellectual legacy in the area of political economy, um, the main thing that probably remains from Alberto is this long uh, group of students that he nurtured over many years. So I went back, now it'll be, um, um, I'll go like um, the long list in the Don Giovanni. In the last uh, nine years, there have been 23 students from Bocconi who are either in a PhD program about to finish or have finished the PhD program and are uh, teaching or working elsewhere. And I want to mention them. Um, they're all here, almost all here. Gualtiero Azzalini, uh, Gualtiero was an RA for Alberto and is now finishing his PhD at the University of Stockholm. Michela Carlana, uh, also a PhD advisee of Alberto, of Alberto is an assistant professor at Harvard Kennedy School. Enrico De Gregorio, also an advisee, is a postdoc at NBR in Cambridge. Giorgio Saponaro, almost done uh, in his PhD uh, at Harvard. Pier Francesco May, uh, also an advisee, also a PhD student at Harvard. Edoardo Teso, Edoardo, also an advisee of Alberto, is an assistant professor at uh, Kellogg School of Management at Northwest University. Matteo Paradisi is 
also an advisee and is a professor at AF, uh, which is the research center of the Bank of Italy in Rome. Matteo Ferroni, uh, PhD student at Boston University. Uh, I'm only talking about the last nine years, and I've got many others here who uh, will, be f will feel left out, but they are from previous generations. Um, Ambra Awa, uh, also an advisee and a PhD student at Harvard. Omar Barbiero, uh, ah, finally a real job, an economist at the Boston Fed. Armando Miano, an advisee, PhD student at Harvard. Igor Cerasa, uh, PhD student at Brown University. Francesca Miserocchi, which, who was with us last night, uh, an advisee, PhD student at Harvard. Leonardo D'Amico, PhD gets boring, PhD student at Harvard. Danny Lamarot, same, PhD student at Harvard. Lorenzo Rigon, um, PhD student at Stanford, so once he went away from Harvard. Uh, Elisabetta Campagna, uh, a research assistant of Alberto, PhD student at the Anderson School of Management at UCLA. De Davide Tagliatela, um, PhD student at Harvard. Maria Carreri, uh, PhD, uh, actually an assistant professor now, she's been moved up, an assistant professor at the uh, University of California, San Diego, in the political science department. Andrea Passalacqua, an economist, at the, an advisee, and an economist at the Federal Reserve. Um, Giampaolo Lecce, uh, who is an assistant professor uh, in Europe once at the University of Groningen. Uh, and Ugo Troiano, um, who is an associate professor, I think, at UC Riverside. I had a hard time following him. Uh, this only past nine years, and then we go back, and there are, ah, I forgot, probably, uh, I forgot one. Um, uh, Marco Tabellini, Marco was an advisee uh, of mine here at Bocconi, and then of Albert at Harvard, and he's an assistant professor at Harvard Business School. So these are only, remember, it's only nine years, and it's only Italy, Alberto, as Silvana testifies, had as many students from, more likely from Latin America than other parts of the world, Latin America and Russia, but many others. So this nine is just a small subset of those who were trained by Alberto in these nine years, and then we can go back many years. So the, um, what we're trying to do, and what uh, Susan referred to, uh, attached to the dedication of the seminar room, is uh, to establish uh, a fund, uh, for a scholarship for students to make sure that they can, um, they can uh, uh, keep on on their research. Uh, you can go on the Bocconi website and you can donate 20 euro or 20,000, depending on your pocket, but donate something because this is something that will, uh, that will remain. Um, Bocconi not only uh, helps students who are uh, studying here, but because of Alberto's insistence, uh, every year um, for the past, is Stephanie around? Stephanie Sancheva, maybe Stephanie is here. For the past um, maybe 10 years, has sent two students a year um, at Harvard to work uh, in the department as a research assistant, uh, undergraduates, Work is and typically, I think, eight out of ten of them have then been accepted as P uh, PhD students at Harvard and then having graduated and, and moved on. Unfortunately, Alberto cannot do this anymore, but his colleague, uh, Stephanie Sancheva, I think there are three, four papers still to be closed between Stephanie and Alberto, is continuing this. And this, I think, at least for Bocconi, is very important because it's a... It's a uh, is an avenue for our students to, uh, to go. Um, and, the, and I'll finish here. And the seminar room, um, Gianmario Verona said this, but it's very important. Uh, departments are, uh, have many rooms, offices, but the seminar room is the place where uh, discussion takes place, where science makes progress, hopefully, uh, and where younger students learn from their teachers. So the seminar room is really the, uh, um, at MIT, uh, where I studied, uh, 
Temet there are too many Nobel Prizes that they could not decide to, na to name uh, the seminar room after one. But in the seminar room at MIT, there are wonderful pictures of uh, Paul Samuelson, Bob Solo, Franco Modigliani. They're all there. So when you attend the seminar, you have these uh, uh, people looking on you. So the, I think the dedication the, the seminar room is, is particularly important. I must say this is an idea of the rector. Um, and I stop here. Thank you. I think, ah, all right, I can, speak, I can speak from here. I just invite on the podium President Monti because we will uh, um, give uh, uh, the plug to, uh, to Susan and uh, we're gonna take a picture and I guess we have finished. So, grazie mille. Mario, 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 if you, Mario and Francesco. So, so. okay. This is, uh, later we will put on our room. Would you like to read this time? <laughs> so thank you all for being here tonight. No, no. get a photo. Yes, uh, we want to, sorry, uh, to take a photo of uh, Susan and us with Alberto's uh, students of various generations. So if you could all come here, we can take a picture. <laughs>